Yo, what up? Okay, so I'm totes repping my Camp Half-Blood swag today, and that's because I'm here to review The Hidden Oracle by Rick Riordan, the first book in the Trials of Apollo series, which is Rick Riordan's new Greek mythology series that follows Apollo, who's been punished by Zeus and turned into a mortal, and he basically has to do penance for his wrongdoings. I was sent this copy for review by Disney Hyperion, so thank you so much to Disney Hyperion, but also, guess what, y'all? They also offered another copy of this book, The Hidden Oracle, so that I can give away one of them to you guys. That's right, I'm giving away a copy of The Hidden Oracle. I mean, I'm not really. They're the ones that are going to be shipping it, but like, I'm kind of facilitating the thing, right? So anyway, so here's how you can win a copy of The Hidden Oracle if you haven't had the opportunity to purchase it yet and you live in the US. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm not the one shipping this, and the people who are shipping this want the winner to be in the US. So you have to be a US resident to win this copy. And to be entered into this giveaway, I want you to be a US resident at least 13 years old, or if you're younger, definitely, definitely have your parents' permission, and leave a comment with a haiku. Don't stress, it doesn't have to be good, it doesn't have to be about Percy Jackson, it's not like I'm gonna be choosing the best one, it's gonna be like a random number generator or whatever, and it's like so easy. Watch, I'll do one right now. Pizza is awesome. I want to eat it all day with pepperoni. Yep, killed it, smashed it. Anyway, that's all you have to do. Just leave a haiku in the comments and after maybe a week, I will pick a winner and then you will get your own copy of The Hidden Oracle. But anyway, enough about the giveaway. There's a thing that Disney Hyperion always does with Rick Riordan's books and that is that they make multiple editions of them and each edition has something exclusive to them. For example, I have the Costco edition and the Costco edition comes with a poster in the back. Here's what the poster looks like all folded up, but then when you unfold it, there is this beautiful and kind of scary artwork in it. So yeah, that's really cool. I know there's a Walmart edition, maybe there's a Target edition. I know for sure there's a Books A Million edition. The Books A Million edition comes with a bumper sticker. I think that's really cool. Moving on, The Trials of Apollo is a five book series that follows Apollo as he attempts to get back into Zeus's good graces so that he can regain his immortality. It's set after the Heroes of Olympus books, so if you haven't read the Percy Jackson and the Olympus books, and if you haven't read the Heroes of Olympus books, then you will be spoiled for those books. I was really, really, really excited for this book, super excited. It was on my most anticipated releases of 2016 video, and that's because Rick Riordan is my favorite, and I always love his books. They're always so much fun to read, his characters are lively and hilarious, and he makes mythology accessible to contemporary readers. However, that being said, I was disappointed with this book. I had some trouble establishing a connection with Apollo, but my main issue with this book was the pacing of the plot. While I was reading, I kept on waiting to see when the bigger plot arc was going to kick in, but I'll talk more about that in the spoiler section. This may just be me, but personally, I didn't think that this book had the same magical, engrossing component to it that Oliver Graydon's other books do. The thing is, I didn't fall in love with it, and because I expected to, and because I normally do with Rick Graydon's books, that made this book strikingly disappointing. So although The Hidden Oracle didn't really live up to my expectations, which were admittedly very, very high, I still enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun reading it. I love going on Rick's adventures, so when they end, I'm kind of sad. If you've read the PJO series and the HOO series, then you're probably a really dedicated Rick Riordan fan, so you've probably already read this or you're planning to read it already. So if you've already read The Hidden Oracle, definitely stay so that we can discuss with spoilers but if you haven't read this book and you don't want to be spoiled, then I would advise leaving in three, two, one. Okay, goodbye, bye, bye, bye. So, Apollo is immortal, but he's not really completely immortal, and that's very confusing to me. Rick Riordan hasn't really set the boundaries of how mortal Apollo exactly is, so there's a lot of gray area. Like, for example, Apollo is immortal, but he can enter Camp Half-Blood but he can't eat ambrosia, and he doesn't have his godly powers, but he can sometimes channel some of them during dire circumstances. So because the line of Apollo's mortality is really blurry, I'm kind of dissatisfied as a reader because I wish it were more concrete. Apollo swears by the river Styx that he is not going to play music or sing, but then he does it anyway. He breaks that promise, and the river Styx is going to come back for him, like, 
for revenge, for punishment, for breaking that oath, and it's going to eat him slowly, like a cancer. So do you guys think that that's how the end of the series is going to be? Do you think in the last book, the River Six is finally going to deliver that final blow to Apollo, you know, push him over the edge, Apollo's going to die, and then Zeus is going to revive him by giving him his immortality? I don't know why I'm planning like four books in advance, but yeah, I just had that thought and I wanted to share it with you guys. Moving on. If you think about the Percy Jackson series, each book in that series kind of follows a very, very similar individual story arc. So it starts with Percy going to camp, then he gets a prophecy, and then he goes off on a quest. So that's the individual story arc of each book, but then also each quest kind of compiles and sums up to create that grander overarching story arc that, that encompasses the entire series. So because that's how PJL was set up, I was expecting that set up to be the same here in the Trials of Apollo, but it wasn't. In the Hidden Oracle, we don't have a prophecy that sets off our characters on a quest, so that kind of threw me off. And while I'm glad that Rick Riordan is branching away from that generic formula that he normally uses in his previous series, I wish that he had replaced it with a plot that was still just as exciting and just as meaningful. And that's where I think the Trials of Apollo, I mean the Hidden Oracle, didn't necessarily meet a standard. Like halfway into the book, we were still at Camp Half-Blood, and I just kept on thinking, when is the real plot going to start? Like, there is a lot of gravity to this situation. Apollo is trying to reclaim his immortality. So why is he wasting time competing in a three-legged race? What? Why? Why is that happening at camp? What is going on? And when is Apollo going to finally have to do like a real trial as in the namesake of this entire series, The Trials of Apollo. So I guess I was just impatient at the pacing of the plot and the fact that I felt like we were wasting time at camp when clearly he needed to be doing much grander things. I'm also confused as to why Chiron would allow the campers to participate in such a dangerous three-legged race when clearly this is a dire situation. Like, campers are disappearing. So why, why in the world would you think that it would be okay for campers to wander into the woods or the labyrinth? What? Why? What? 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 That just didn't seem like a logical decision to me, especially, especially coming from a character as wise as Chiron. Also, that scene when Apollo is coming back from the forest and he has news about what's happening to these disappearing campers and he's like, Chiron, I need to tell you something. I need to, it's important, it's important. And Chiron is like, no, 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 not right now, later, tell me later, I'm really busy right now. I kept thinking that Chiron would never dismiss Percy like that. He would have immediately understood that something important was going on and that Percy had something very crucial to say and he would have postponed the race, but he didn't do that for Apollo. And maybe this is Rick Riordan's way of letting us know that Apollo really hasn't earned Chiron's respect yet or that he hasn't proven himself to I guess earn that instant attention from Chiron like Percy does, but also on the other hand I feel like Chiron has worked for so long with so many heroes that he should be able to distinguish when somebody has something really important to say. From the moment Meg defended Apollo at the beginning of this book with the garbage and the banana peels, the banana peels is what really told me. I knew she was a daughter of Demeter and I thought that there was a possibility that she could have been the daughter of a minor god or goddess that I wasn't familiar with, but out of the main 12, I guess, Olympians, I was like, definitely Demeter. Meg was an interesting character with her betrayal and all, but like, not interesting in a necessarily good way. She has a surprisingly dark issue about who she trusts and why she trusts them, and she's subjected to a degree of emotional manipulation that I, as a reader, didn't fully believe. When I think about it logically, I can see how it would make sense because she was very young, she's still very young, she's still very impressionable, but as a reader, while I was reading, I didn't find it very convincing and I didn't understand how she could possibly think that Nero was two separate people, that there was Nero and then there was the beast and that it was her fault if she triggered the beast. Like I understand it, but I don't completely understand it, if you know what I mean. On a related note, the villain in this book is Nero, who was this crazy Roman emperor dude, and he's a god now because he's still remembered. And he has this line about Wikipedia keeping him alive, which begs the question of how does one become a god? Can anybody become a god? I know a part of it is being remembered, but do you also have to be worshipped as well? And if you do, then do you have to be worshipped during your time, like when you're alive, or do you have to be 
continuously worshipped throughout history to become a god. If all that matters is being remembered or being remembered widely, then that means anybody with a Wikipedia page is a god, right? Because Wikipedia ensures that everyone is remembered widely. I don't really understand that and I wish Rick Redden had made it clearer in the book. Apollo as a narrator was very interesting and very different than Rick Riordan's other narrators. In the books, Rick Riordan always makes his gods, as well as his monsters, extremely naive and foolish and arrogant and easily tricked, and he maintained that characteristic with Apollo. So Apollo was arrogant and naive like all the other gods in Rick Riordan's books. However, I think the more time Apollo spends as a mortal, the more his character will develop into that of a demigod, someone who's more compassionate and more considerate and not so self-obsessed. And we're already kind of seeing that change, seeing that development in his character in this first book alone. Something that also made Apollo a different narrator was that he was a father, so he is rooming in a cabin full of his children, and seeing that paternal component to him was very, very nice. When he is worried about his children's safety, when he wants to save them, that's when he becomes the most soft and the most vulnerable and to me the most likable. So that's when he feels the most human. Oh, and another thing. Sorry, anytime I say, oh, and another thing, I wanna follow it up with, oh, and another thing, Mr. H of Enlightenment, don't lecture me about the war, you didn't fight in it. Hashtag Hamel trash. But yeah, oh, and another thing that made Apollo different was that he was openly bisexual. He found himself attracted to both sexes and he freely discussed it in his internal monologue. And I appreciate that Rick Riordan seems to really be trying to incorporate more LGBTQI plus representation into his books. As for characters we've seen before, we get to see Percy, which is cool and nice and everything. And don't get me wrong, I love Percy Jackson with all my heart and he's definitely my favorite book boyfriend of all time in the history of ever. Like, I love him. I'm in love with him. I just don't think that we necessarily need to keep on seeing him in all of Rick Riordan's future series. Like, it's nice to see him. Like, in my opinion, he's had his turn and his stories have been told, so I don't necessarily miss him all the time. Nico and Will are the cutest thing ever. Oh my god. Oh my god. They're so, so cute. I love the part when Nico is like, yeah, I have a doctor's note. And then Will is like, that, that's me. I'm, I'm his doctor. And I'm just, oh my god. They're so cute. I can't handle. I talked about this briefly in my Blood of Olympus book review and I was just fangirling all over the place over Solangelo. Still doing that. That is still present day me. I am still fangirling over Solangelo. I think they're the cutest. And also, surprise, Leo Valdez showed up at the end of this book and he brought back Calypso with him and Calypso is now immortal because she's off of OGG. Okay, so this is random and ridiculous, but we learned in this book that Sally, Percy's mother, is pregnant with a daughter, right? So Percy is going to have a younger half-sister, I guess it would be called? Sally's a little old to be pregnant. She's 40 but I don't think that'll be a problem in this book. What's crazy though is that this little girl is going to be entering this world, right? And her older brother is going to have been the kid who saved the world on multiple occasions. Will she know? Would she understand? Does she even realize who she's going to be a relative of? Like, I don't know if I should be envious of her or sorry because like, imagine having your older brother be, like, the world's best demigod. Like, I hope she has a sweater, because that is a huge shadow to be living in. But anyway, the ridiculous thing that I mentioned before is that I want Rick Riordan to write, like, a spin-off series, or maybe even just a standalone, about Percy's younger sister. But I want it to be realistic fiction, I want it to be a contemporary novel with no mythological elements to it, just like a normal girl going to school, maybe finding a boy and falling in love with him, or a girl, who cares? Just like Percy's younger sister living a normal life. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if Rick Riordan wrote a contemporary romance about Percy's younger sister? Just think about it. Just think about it. I think that'd be great. Anyway, on that note, that is all I have to say about The Hidden Oracle, the first book in The Trials of Apollo. It's far from my favorite of Rick Riordan's books, but I still enjoyed it, and of course I'm going to continue reading the series until it's over. Please let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. Did you completely love it? Were you a little disappointed? I'd love to know what you thought of Apollo as a narrator and where you think the series is going to go from here. So like any theories you have, I would love to hear those. And also, if you have a favorite scene, I'd love to know that as well. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you'll have a fantastic day and happy reading. Goodbye!